Française de Bruno, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program on the occasion of the European Day of Languages 2021. Welcome to everybody joining us here on the online webinar and to everybody on Facebook Live. At the initiative of the Council of Europe, the European Day of Languages has been celebrated every year since September 26, 2001. So this year marks the 20th anniversary of the celebrations worldwide. As we celebrate the European Day of Languages, we also celebrate linguistic diversity and plurilingualism. We celebrate the importance of language learning and intercultural understanding. For this year's program, we're delighted to be partnering with amazing institutions and organizations with, without whom we could not have done this and we could not have put together this program. Hence, first of all, a very special welcome and thank you goes out to our co-organizer, the Istituto Italiano di Cultura di Mumbai, the Italian Culture Center of Mumbai and their director, Francesca Amendola. We also extend a very big thank you to our co-partners this year, the delegation of the European Union to India and Bhutan, the Consulate General of Switzerland and Mumbai, the Polish Institute, New Delhi, Savitri Bai Pule, Pune University, and the Language Portal. Thank you, Dankeschön, merci. I will now hand over to my esteemed colleague, the director of the Alliance Française de Pune, Ms. Adele Spiza, for some further notes on this year's program. Adele, over to you. Thank you, Miriam, and a warm welcome to all of you. My name is Adèle Spizer. I'm the director of the Alliance Française de Pune, and indeed I'm delighted to uh, start this session with you. So this webinar is only, let's say, the tip of the iceberg, because there have been many other events going on in the framework of this uh, 2021 edition of the European Day of Languages. Uh, today, a series of language taster workshops have been conducted throughout, throughout the day, and on behalf of the team, uh, let me express our gratitude towards the facilitators who, uh, you know, showed us glimpses about different languages and countries. Also, as part of this program, and thanks to the General Consulate of Switzerland in Mumbai, we invite you to discover a language that is spoken only by 0.5% of the population of Switzerland, Romansh. So today and tomorrow, join us on Facebook and learn to speak Romansh with a crash course of five video lessons. Uh, and now, coming to our event, I have the privilege to present you the exceptional set of panelists who kindly accepted to join us today for this very promising discussion. So around the virtual table, we have with us Thierry Poibot, who is a CNRS Director of Research and Head of the Lattice Laboratory since 2012. Bonjour Thierry. Um, we also have Ralf Kruger, who is Professor of Language and Translation Technology at the Institute of Translation and Multilingual Communication at TH Köln. Guten Tag, Ralf. Chiara Lasala is an Associate Professor of Italian at the School of Languages, Cultures and Society at the University of Leeds. Buongiorno, Chiara. Shama Davadkar is an associate assistant professor in the Department of French and Francophone Studies in the University of Goa. Namaste, Shama. And Richard Simcott is hyper polyglot and founder of the Polyglot Conference. So, Richard, actually, you speak so many languages that I don't know exactly how to welcome you. So, I will keep it simple for now. I just say good evening, Richard. And um, last but not least, as a moderator of the session, we have Mr. Sandeep Nulka, founder and CEO of Bit Private Limited and co founder of Vernac Language Technologies, that develops India's first crowdsourced translation platform. Sandeep, we are absolutely delighted to have you on board for this session and we are looking forward for this. Um, uh, dear viewers, thank you for attending the session. You are most welcome to leave your comments and questions in the chat box. There's also a poll uh, section where you can uh, give your insights as well. And you will also find indication about the guest and, um, and this webinar in general. Without further ado, uh, let us start the conversation. Thanks again, everyone, for your interest and support. And Sandeep, over to you. Yes, I ensured that my mic was on. OK. So thank you, Adele. And uh, welcome, all of you. 
uh, I will probably speak for a few minutes to just uh, set the tone, uh, give you the context of uh, what we plan to discuss today. So uh, I remember way back uh, in the early 90s, uh, someone asked me what I did. And I remember telling that gentleman that I was a translator and I still remember his expression and his words very clearly. He said, oh, wow. And uh, what do you do for a living? So I think we started there and cut to 2021. Uh, we still have uh, weird reactions as in, you know, uh, any translator would typically uh, still face a comment such as, you know, but doesn't Google Translate do that job already? So basically what's in it for you is what people are wondering. And it's actually true. Uh, unfortunately, it does. Uh, Google Translate does a better and better job with every passing day. And especially uh, for most uh, European languages. And as if this wasn't enough, we uh, have also made significant progress uh, in voice technology and in so many other areas uh, that the subject of today's discussion might actually need some rephrasing. So instead of language learning in the era of translation technology, we might want to first ask if we even need to learn new languages uh, with technologies disrupting virtually every area of language service delivery, be it translation, interpreting, voiceover, and to some extent, probably even teaching. Uh, obviously, the answer is yes, we do need to learn languages because otherwise we would not have uh, had any need to have this session. Uh, so, but really gone are the days when you could, you know, simply sign up, learn a language functionally and expect to get a fancy job. Up until now, I remember reading on notice boards uh, at the university, at the Alliance, Max Miller. Uh, and of, of course, I am sure there are still ads that keep cropping up. But uh, up until a few years ago, it almost seemed like even if you know a little bit of something, we will pick you up and we'll make you useful. But I think uh, that changed very quickly in the last two or three years. Now, firstly, uh, a lot of finance, uh, as in there were a lot of political changes, a lot of changes uh, uh, in terms of the economy in many countries. And suddenly outsourcing became a bad word. The Indian IT industry took a hit. With that happening, jobs kind of started drying up a little bit. Now, uh, that happened in tandem with India also kind of beginning to lose its cost advantage uh, to some East European countries. Jobs for foreign language students thereby further started de uh, decreasing. Google Translate, of course, uh, kept getting better and better. And of course, Google is just uh, one of the many names. There are so many more. Uh, there are so many free ones. There are so many paid ones. and uh, they do an incredible job in some languages and some domains. So uh, many translators, so to say, uh, lost all the what I call typical run of the mill jobs like, you know, business correspondence, internal communication. No one comes to uh, translators with that kind of stuff anymore, uh, which used to be like the lowest hanging fruit for any translator back in the day. Uh, you make quick money. It doesn't take you know, too much uh, effort. It's just a letter. It just is done very quickly. Uh, but those are not the kind of jobs that are coming in anymore. Even specialized jobs now, some specialized jobs. So for example, there is a, a machine translation engine that does a very, very good job when it comes to German to English and in the field of uh, say legal documents. So something like that, uh, until someone needs something really very specific, uh, people are even losing those kind of jobs now. So like I love to say, the traditional translator as we knew them is dead. Uh, just because one can translate uh, doesn't really mean you will uh, still have a job uh, or you'll have adequate jobs. Today, translators are also more and more, uh, you know, required to work 
uh, as post editors of machine translated content now mind you uh, that's a completely different skill altogether just because you can translate well doesn't necessarily mean that you can post uh, edit well for one uh, you need to be better than the machine translation output so if you're not good enough you won't see anything as being wrong so you technically can't fix much so uh, that really increases so to say the entry barrier and that already rules out certain people who back in the day could have probably got a job so that really brings us to the buzzword of the industry in today's day and age at least in india which is employability how employable exactly are our students and if they are not what can we do to make them more empl employable that's really the question now since uh, i'm not a teacher by profession and thereby don't claim any expertise uh, in academics or how languages are or should be taught uh but i do have my ears very close to the ground i interact with a lot of uh, stakeholders in the industry and so i'm just going to throw some thoughts uh, so that we can start this discussion with the panel today uh these are just random thoughts ideas suggestions uh, if you will so first of all there is a very pressing need to redesign foreign language teaching methods drawing from the concept of clil clil uh, c l i l it stands for content and language integrated learning now this is an experiment that was done uh, with the blessings of the eu uh, we had one such uh, course that was run in pune uh, i uh, happened to be there at the inauguration of that and uh, that basically is ideal for a country where it's very easy to find someone uh who has a mother tongue but that's not the same as the local language and none of these two are the same as that student's medium of instruction so there are technically three languages that a student is dealing with that's where content and language integrated learning comes into the picture where you actually use these techniques and methods to make it easier for uh, people to learn certain concepts uh adapting that to foreign languages uh, it could probably mean that instead of uh, learning words like you know a book a pen or whatever as in one can still learn those but you could include more terminology that is from the technology space so that it make, make students you know more hands on the second thing is of course uh, teachers of foreign languages uh, need to start encouraging students to learn how to read and type not necessarily read and write but read and type in their mother tongue and if possible at least one more indian language uh, just some figures here for you to understand the scale of the problem uh, there are about 900 million internet users in india and more than 75% of those users do not speak english at all which means they access the internet either preferably through their mother tongue or through voice now that really opens up a huge amount of potential for language students and uh, when i am talking now obviously we are talking uh, on a day where we are celebrating european languages so why am i talking about indian languages because in india if uh, you want to push students to learn foreign languages you also have to equip them with skills that will make them employable so you have to reinvent foreign language learning and adapt to it uh, to a country like india and trust me every every uh, field has done that you think of uh, think of some something as simple as mcdonalds and they have probably an aloo tikki burger only in india nowhere else in the world and which is exactly why india is such a unique country and every class can very easily have people coming in from so many different uh, regions and speaking so many different languages that you can't have a one size fits all approach if you want to have students keep uh, coming back to the institute so uh, indian languages is something that needs to be encouraged because alongside the foreign languages that you are learning and that you are expected to uh, apply the knowledge that you have acquired that is an additional asset which makes students employable including a basic overview of the skill sets that the industry expects of students 
so many people uh, so many students uh, coming out of language institutes are picked up by the industry be it e-commerce companies engineering companies what have you uh, what are the kind of skill sets that they look for the basic would be communication skills writing skills computer skills intercultural communication all this doesn't look like you know it belongs to foreign language learning and i'm not saying we need to dwell too much on these aspects but touching upon these things and making uh, students aware that they need to uh, probably be better at these skills and giving them so so to say a head start would go a long way in making them employable uh, offering flexible online courses that are tailor made for working professionals from diverse sectors that's another way of uh, expanding the reach of uh, language learning in india because there is definitely and by that i don't mean online uh, classes where people are supposed to attend every uh, alternate day or every day i mean uh, something that you can take at your own pace uh, with a teacher integrated if and where required so something like that and the idea is to have as many people as uh, you possibly can take up learning foreign languages because if our institutes are not doing it apps are already doing it and people are learning on so many apps and we want them to come to the institute and not go to the app having a dedicated alumni and placement cell is according to me a near mandatory requirement for every language teaching institute today you have to have that in place every b school worth its salt has it and there's no reason why uh, language institute should be uh, an exception and here's something uh, that uh, i had already proposed at the alliance you have to make language learning fun not to say that it's not fun today uh but i think the spin uh, we said we would want to try and give it at the alliance was we also teach french so french teaching and french learning uh, is one of the many things that you get to do if you're at the alliance because today every student every youngster uh, doesn't want those conventional uh, ways of being taught they want to have fun they want to really enjoy themselves and if while doing that they learn the language that will be incredible so basically when we make students more employable uh, we give students newer students a reason to continue to flock to our centers so i think uh, with this i'm going to uh, open the panel uh, and this is slightly different as in typically in a panel discussion uh, you have the moderator ask questions and then those questions are answered but i think we have such an incredibly uh, knowledgeable and experienced panel today uh, here i don't really want to limit uh, their knowledge and experience to my questions or any questions for that matter and i would like them to have a free hand and talk about what their area of expertise is how is that area of expertise affecting uh, services like translation interpreting or even teaching and what in their opinion should students do to become more employable so let me start uh, with uh, thierry uh if you could shed some uh, light on these aspects that would be great thank you very much sandeep so as i said at the beginning so i am a senior researcher working in france on uh, natural language processing and uh, machine translation uh so what uh, sandeep said in the introduction uh, reminds me of things i'm uh, doing so i have published a book on uh, machine translation recently and as you may know in uh, so five years ago already there have been a big change on all the on the tools that can find on the internet so google translation but also microsoft tools and other tools with the advent of deep learning which means that now as sandeep said most of this uh, machine translation system that you can find online for free work at a professional level so that's true and not quite true so it means that it's true for around 20 languages in the world so mainly european languages and also things like chinese uh, uh, chinese japanese maybe arabic and some because there are lots of data and because there have been lots of money invested in this uh, domain so to give you an example in european institution so for example the european court of justice 
employed uh, more than 1,000, 1,500, I think, translators, professional translators of people, but they are also using tools that help them uh, translate. And they are really, it was not the case before because the quality was quite low with the tools, but since a few years ago, they are using professional tools. And because their cost of the budget is limited, that is also why they are still able to translate about uh, with the 20 something, 22 languages in Europe. They have introduced recently a 22nd language. So it's, it's a lot of things because it means that you have to translate everything into another language, but they managed to solve because they are using this kind of technology. So of course, it does not solve all the problems. So there are lots of, uh, of problems for other languages first. So I said it translates accurately for around 20 languages, but there are still some mistakes even for between French and English, for example, or some languages like this that, I, that are well covered. But there is also for lots of other languages. So if you uh, take into consideration that there are 7,000 uh, languages on the world, so it's not very precise, but it's between six and 7,000, there are lots, of, uh, most, of the, uh, most of the languages don't have anything. So, and why? Because there's a lack of training data. So it means that to have a system that works, you need to have uh, millions of sentences in your language that have been translated to target language. So you mean to have bilingual corpora, and this is not available for most of the languages, of course. And so it means that it also increases the language domination. So it means that language that have good technology, like, uh, of course, English, but also French, uh, German, and maybe Chinese, Japanese, and so on, have a uh, big power because it works and because they have access to this technology. So if you work in, a, if you have a, another languages for which you don't have this technology, that's also a problem for the, to have access to information and to have access to lots of, uh, of data. So the fact that these tools uh, work so well is a, can be a problem for a professional translator. So you have new jobs appearing. So Sandeep said already that you have uh, post editing and post editing is true that it's not translation. It's uh, quite different. Uh, skills that you must have to be able to post edit. And the idea is not to have a perfect translation, but just to go quick and to, to, to correct what is not correct in the translation. And uh, I think for the employability, because it's, that seems to be a, a keyword for this uh, meeting, uh, students should be, of course, trained in machine translation and maybe more than machine translation, but all the tools that uh, linguists are using to help them uh, translate. For language learning, the benefit is uh, less clear, I think. Uh, so, of course, you people have access to these tools, but these tools make uh, still make a lot of errors. So, especially if it's not English, that is uh, the source of target language. So, there are errors, and of course, if you are a learner, most of the time you don't know what is good and what is a mistake. So, that can be a problem. So, you have tools that translate, but when you are a learner, it's very hard from these tools to know what is correct, what is not correct, what is a good translation and what is not so good translation. And people should not trust the system, but that's a problem that most students and the general public in general trust the system. And even very educated people, because you see the translation and sometimes the text that can be produced by these tools is not really perfect. So the text is perfect, but it's not perfect translation. I mean that the, the kind of text you produce in the target language is good, but it does not mean that it is a good translation. And you have to educate the student to, to be able to recognize these kind of things. And that's not so, so easy to do. Uh, but of course, if it's correctly used, it uh, can be very useful to have this kind of tools for, uh, for students, and it can be a big help also for, uh, for language learning. So I think it can be, uh, there are lots of po new possibilities with this kind of tools. You can translate more documents, you can have some new opportunities. So since people translate more documents, it means that there are more uh, linguists and more translators involved, and that can open some new, new jobs. There are also new jobs like post-editing, which is not an interesting, so it can be something interesting in some context. And so people uh, are doing this for their job and that's a good job in some context. It's also, of course, also a possible threat, especially for uh, very uh, general translation. So it's when it translates, when translation is as good as human, of course, it means that the, the need for translators is not uh, so clear. So you need to, to prove that it's useful and you need to, to see where to put humans. But I think machine translation will not replace humans, but it's uh, we are at the strange days where the technology is very good. It, in some cases, it's, it's used directly, but we have to find a, a way to work with humans. And the last thing is that we have machine translation that produce a text, and that is not always the most useful uh, 
output for a personal translator. So one uh, area of research for the future is probably to have tools that produce uh, piece, pieces of translation that helps the, the translator to translate, but that, that does not produce a full translation that is sometimes very hard to, to take into account and to, to correct. So I think there is a lot of research to be done, and I hope uh, people who are developing these, these systems can work with personal translators to have better systems that are useful for everybody. And uh, I really hope it will be a, a chance for translators and not a threat for them in the future. So thank you very much, and I, I leave the floor for the next panelist. Thank you so much, uh, Thierry. Uh, Ralph, can you win maybe? Yes, thank you very much for having me in this very interesting panel conversation. I just share a brief presentation with you in a minute. Just put this to full screen. There we go. I mean, Thierry also uh, already gave a very good good overview of, of what modern machine translation technology can do and, and can't do and uh, what is the the influence on, on, on translators, on post-editing. I just want to add a brief well, perspective from, from the professional translation process to this. So what are the effects of, of neural machine translation or NMT for short in the professional translation process? Very few words about me. I've been introduced already. I'm professor of language and translation technology in uh, Cologne in Germany. Uh, I'm doing teaching and research in NMT, MT didactics, meaning how can you teach translation students also the technical dimension of machine translation, usability of computer assisted translation tools, and so on. I'm the chair of the MA in specialized translation program in Cologne, and seems like ages ago I've been working as a specialized translator, and I do so now from, from time to time also to see how, how machine translation affects this professional translation process. It's a very brief overview so that we see where we're coming from, where we are today. The historical quality development of machine translation started after the Second World War. Here you see um, over time steady increase in, in, in quality, different, different paradigms here. What we're seeing now, this new approach, neural machine translation, it started in 2014. This is where the curve goes up. This ends at 2016. So I'd say we, we may be here or the, the curve, quality curve has gone, gone up even more in the last years. But as Thierry also said, there, there are still problems with MT. At some point, it's very astonishing how good the systems are, but there's also some systemic limitations which prevent them from really performing at professional human quality. So there are remaining problems. The gap is getting a bit smaller, but there's kind of a glass ceiling where these systems can't, can't out, outperform anymore. The brief overview, it's called the Taos Content Pyramid by the Translation Automation User Society, where they give different text types or genre, genres that are tra translated in the, the, the actual translation profession, like documentation, maintenance support documents, marketing, etc. And prior to the introduction of uh, neural machine translation, the, the dividing line between human translation, HT, and machine translation, MT, was here, meaning everything below was uh, could be translated uh, by machines. Everything up here was the realm of human translation. And they claim that with the introduction of neural machine translation, this, this borderline shifted upwards so that text types which previously were translated by humans, like user interfaces or documentation, they're now uh, they can now be translated by machines and uh, the, the, the niche for humans is getting smaller. We are here in the marketing brand where you meet this creativity, human touch, et cetera. So this is where humans still excel and everything else is, uh, can be translated or pre-translated and then post-edited. So this is the, the basic idea there. Um, there is a survey uh, among European language service providers every year. It's called ELIS, European Language Industry Survey. And for 2021, they asked about uh, what is your uh, outlook on machine translation over the next five years. And I thought this was very interesting. Very few language service providers said that they're going to leave the industry. Some say it will not happen, meaning that MT gets even better. I think this is a minority opinion. Some say that they want to focus on other services, but what is most interesting, 
a lot of them say we're going to focus on niche translation where humans did excel like around our marketing so this is what we saw in this content pyramid and the others say they're going to focus on mtpe which is machine translation post editing so there's going to be more post editing in the future but also the, these niche markets where, where human translators are still needed Um, this is some research from uh, Microsoft, I, I guess it is just some, some basic overview of what machine translation can do or can't do. They're really good at punctuation, morphology, syntax, so you could say that grammar and punctuation is almost a solved problem for machine translation. This depends on the language pairs, of course, and most of the errors are here in the realm of lexical semantic errors where you have ambiguity, et cetera, where you need to draw on context. This is something where these uh, systems have problems with uh, taking into account context. So all this grammatical stuff is covered quite well by MT and here where context is required. This is where these uh, systems are still somewhat weak. This I found a very interesting overview ranking of different languages from English again by Microsoft where you can see for Indian languages Hindi is on uh, eighth position so quite good also before German and if you're seeing comparable uh, quality from English to Hindi than we see from English to German, then their systems, they are quite good at some times. There are further languages, I think, from the Indian family. I'm hoping I'm not embarrassing myself here. Telugu is at 18th, Tamil is at 30, Urdu at 42. I'm not sure this is because of typological differences between these languages and English or simply because, as Cherry said, there's not enough training data to, to come up with high quality machine translation systems. Some limitations of current NMT systems, the, the GIGO principle, meaning garbage in, garbage out. If you feed them faulty source text, like Cologne is the capital of Germany, Google will translate Köln is the Hauptstadt von Deutschland, which means Cologne is the capital of Germany. It's nice, but it's completely wrong. So if you put wrong, wrong text in, you get a nice sounding wrong translation out. This is something you have to keep in mind. There's some bias in the training data. It's called machine bias. The, the example is quite telling. If you give the system the sentence, the nurse was struggling with the virus outbreak. In German, you have die Krankenschwester, meaning nurse is, is uh, rendered as female by Google Translate. If you say the doctor was struggling with the outbreak, you get der Arzt, which is the, the male doctor. So you have these gender stereotypes in the training data that nurses are always female. Doctors are always male and these systems, they, they, they learn these biases and reflect them in their translations. This is something that uh, you have to take into account. So you need to de-bias these systems as a human post editor, be aware of these biases and act accordingly. These systems are blind towards contextual, extra textual factors. There is some research in multimodal MT, which can also look at videos or, 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 or pictures also and integrate these into translation, but this is still in its infancy. And they're prone to making catastrophic mistakes. Sometimes you have random additions or omissions. This has become less in the uh, in recent times, but still you have this, this notion of it's deceptively fluent. It looks good, but you can't trust it to be correct, to be a, a, a correct translation from a content point of view. And I'm sorry for this. This is the last slide. It's not very accessible, I'd say. I just try to to give an overview of the, the competences you need after the introduction of MT when you work with MT as a partner, as a human translator. And the idea is that the, your text production competence, which was quite important uh, previously, that you can write good text from scratch, it's uh, becoming less significant, meaning the circle here is smaller. Whereas your text reception competence, you need to be able to read more text. You need to read the, the source text, you need to read the, the, the output produced by the machine translation system. Perhaps you're working with several systems like Google or in, in Europe, we have DeepL and then judge which uh, output, output is better, which if you want to post edit, you need to have a text selection competence. So different raw output is uh, presented to you and you have to select among this content. Uh, content. And uh, production competence is less significant, but your text adaptation or optimization competence is more important. So you get raw output, which is faulty to some extent, and you need to optimize this, uh, this content. So you have the, these shifts in, in, in translation competence, which, which are happening under the influence of neural machine translation. And that was it from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. 
and may I now invite uh, Richard. Yeah. Richard, could you? Yeah, sure. Hello, you... Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. And um, just to sort of follow on from this, from my experience, translation and anything to do with translating from one language to another, whether that's orally as interpretation or translating the written language, has formed part of other roles that I've had. So it's not been the main role in and of itself. Uh, my background is in diplomacy and also in uh, working in technical services as well as marketing and uh, customer service roles. I uh, work as a languages consultant and uh, I give advice on how to manage multilingual projects uh, on a global scale for our international clients at the social element. Um, now, when it comes to uh, working with languages and using translation as a tool within a role, uh, the things that I tend to work with are to do with the marketing, these top tier things that, um, that we just heard about now from Ralph. And um, I noticed very, very soon after I started talking to other people who were working with languages or studying languages or interested on in how to actually use them, uh, that there was a gap of where academics and people who work in business and in different institutions where roles are available, as well as just people interested in languages themselves, where they could get together and actually meet. And so I set up uh, an event called the Polyglot Conference uh, about eight years ago. So in 2013, I had a, the first event where we had presentations on various aspects of language, and that would cover any language uh, that was uh, important for the speaker, uh, for their roles or for what they were doing. And it gave the opportunity to share ideas and to get together and actually find out the practical steps to get into a position or to uh, study more about languages. And this international community has built and grown from there. And this is just one of the focal touch points that we have throughout the year. And it will take place this year in October. And of course, any of you are welcome to come. Now, uh, when it comes to learning languages and just to sort of talk about what Sandeep was saying the, about the Indian languages, uh, languages within India, of course, getting down into uh, your mother tongue or, or into the languages of the community are extremely important because what that does is it helps to really speak to the people who are working and living through that language and build the connections out from that point. Uh, Sandeep rightly said, a number of people may not actually be able to use English as a lingua franca or another language. And in fact, the, there could be combinations that you wouldn't expect. So yes, we've got representation here from uh, some of the major European languages. And of course, this day is about celebrating all European languages. So I would also say that in my own experience, actually after French, Spanish, German, Italian, some of the languages I've used most are languages like Swedish or Dutch. And the reason is, is that a lot of these countries where there are languages that are not widely studied outside of uh, the European context, it's because they have quite developed economies that would potentially have interests in certain areas where maybe products are produced, or maybe there are other services that could be used uh, for uh, communication on a business level. And so it's very, very important to make sure that you have a solid foundation in the languages of the region where you are. So knowing your neighbor's languages, knowing your own language, being able to use it, and then also hopefully promote it for other people to uh, get into that uh, exchange of information culturally and linguistically, but also looking at other countries and areas where there might be another language that might be a little bit different to what you would expect to learn at school. Now, of course, languages like French and uh, German and Spanish and Italian are all very important languages. They're very good languages to learn, and they have a, num a lot of speakers. So 
my advice would be to plug into these networks that we've grown over the years so that you also can learn from other people who have been through this experience of learning these languages, working with these languages, and getting really under the skin of the cultures and societies that they are part of, so that you expand not only your knowledge and your linguistic ability but also your options and your awareness of opportunities that you can take advantage of as an individual looking at the market for a role where you can progress in your career and that's it thank you very much thank you Rick richard uh, kiara could you go next Hi, hello, uh, good afternoon, and thanks very much for inviting me to this very interesting discussion and panel. So yes, I am Chiara and I am an associate professor of Italian at the School of Languages, Cultures and Society at the University of Leeds. Uh, I graduated from the University of Rome, La Sapienza, with a degree in modern languages and literatures. I did English and German. I took an MA in Applied Linguistics at the University of Salford and then in 2004 completed a PhD at the University of Leeds on minority languages and dialects in modern Italy. I've been working at Leeds University, the School of Language, Languages, Cultures and Societies since 95 and before that I worked for two years at the University of Salford in the Department of Languages. I teach Italian languages, Italian language at all levels, from beginners to degree level, um, all language skills, and I also teach a translation module for final year st students from English into Italian. So this is not a professional course in translation, but it gives students a flavor of what the profession is like, and uh, some of them decide to do an MA in translation um, after uh, graduating. As part of my job, I also take academic roles uh, related to language learning and teaching, uh, and I'm active in research. So to give you an idea of my different roles, um, I was uh, uh, Italian language coordinator, I was a school widening participation officer, then a school residence abroad coordinator, director of the Italian unit, and I also have the role of deputy director of the Leeds Center for Excellence in Language Teaching. So to give you an idea of the, active, the activities I carried out as language coordinator, one of them is uh, uh, my investigation on the common European framework of references for languages, the CAFR, and its integration in our Italian language program. And in 2013-14, I was awarded the Teaching Development Grant by the Higher Education Academy, which allowed me to carry out my project promoting the CAFR from prog for progression from ab initio, from beginners to degree challenges, uh, studying uh, theoretical implication and working with students as partners in reshaping assessment and feedback procedures. Consequently, Recently, I resigned the Italian language program conforming to the guidelines of the CAFR. Therefore, I have contributed extensively to the development of the assessment policy in my school, providing a model for assessing written and oral production already used by the Italian unit. Subsequently, I've offered advice and support on its implementation both internally and externally. In my previous role of widening participation officer, I led on the delivery of several widening participation activities, such as the Lingua Star Summer Residential Program. So the purpose of uh, Lingua Stars and other programs of this nature is to encourage students from a disadvantaged background to consider a language degree. And I was also an external advisor to Pearson World Class, class Qualifications in the process of creating the new Italian A-level syllabus. Um, my key areas uh, uh, of research in second language acquisition are uh, um, error analysis and transfer analysis, uh, language progress in ab initio and post-level context in higher education, 
digital resources to enhance language learning, new methodologies to teach grammar, and the integration of the common European framework into teaching and assessment. In uh, September 2017, I organized an international conference, developing skills, uh, uh, sorry, developing speaking skills at the University of Leeds, uh, which brought together uh, practitioners from modern foreign language, English as a foreign language, and English for academic purposes to discuss the nature and the challenges in the field of language pedagogy. Uh, more recently, I got a fellowship from the Leeds Institute for Teaching Excellence to carry out my project on the enhancement of the pedagogic practice in higher education through the engagement of postgraduate research students. So for me, doing a language degree was a really an incredible journey and has been a brilliant experience because it has allowed me to develop the necessary language skills to work in a different country and to choose a job that I really enjoy, that I'm really passionate about. And uh, I'll try to share my screen, otherwise, uh, um, okay. Can you see my screen? Um, I'm not sure. Yes, you can see. Okay, thank you. So, um, so basically, why study modern languages and cultures, which skills students develop? So intercultural understanding and communication. This means uh, linguistic fluency, understanding how language works and understanding culture. So knowing a language is a way to understand the culture of the language you are studying. And in, ter in terms of personal development, a degree in modern languages gives you advantage to develop ad adaptability and independence, analytical and research skills, communication skills, group working and leadership skills. So these are excellent career prospects for uh, 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 a graduate in modern languages. And uh, I want to give you just a flavor of the uh, jobs UK, UK language graduates do. So you can see it's a very versatile degree and that gives you opportunity of working in translation and interpreting media as for a correspondence in the BBC, freelance journalism, business services for so providing translating, interpreting and report writing to business, marketing, speech therapy, banking finance, sales, retail, transport and communication, community social services, public administration and teaching at primary, secondary, tertiary level, as well as uh, teaching English as a foreign language. Um, in the field of tourism, publishing, health, and social work. And uh, uh, I really would like to finish off with, uh, with the residence abroad period, which is uh, an excellent opportunity for our graduates to develop employability skills. So the residence abroad period is compulsory for a language graduate and it's integrated in our degree. So graduates can uh, do the year abroad in their second or third year of study depending on the language they study. And they have different options so they can study abroad uh, in a university or they can be assistant teachers so teaching English in secondary or primary schools or a work placement which is uh, organized or self-found in a company, a bank, charity, or other organizations. So um, what are the top five employment skills provided by the residence abroad period? So obviously international experience, and then uh, problem solving. Uh, obviously, uh, studying abroad strengthens strengthen people's independence, resourcefulness, and problem solving skills, which are really skills that employers really value. Uh, they really rely on these uh, uh, skills when they uh, employ uh, a graduate in language. Um, adaptability, 
so students who make the most of the opportunity to study or work abroad uh, really strengthen their, uh, their ability to adapt. They have to adapt to a new situation, to a new context, um, to a different culture. So absolutely, language skills and, of course, networking, because uh, they're going to be exposed to uh, so many different people, students, and also uh, communication skills. They have uh, really to be uh, great communicators, uh, not only in their language, but in the other language. So I'll finish off just with this uh, really testimonial from a student. So just to give you the student perspective on the residence abroad period. So the student emphasizes on uh, uh, how difficult it can be, but it's a huge opportunity for personal growth and development. And the fact that uh, this person is now a more independent and stronger person for the experience. And that's it. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chiara. And uh, okay. Shama, uh, please could you shed some light and uh, just for the benefit of our viewer, viewers and everyone who's listening in, uh, I particularly uh, feel Shama has the ability to bring in a very different perspective because she's one of the very few French teachers, at least in India, who comes from an engineering background and not uh, from the arts background. So over to you, Shama. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, a very good evening. Bonjour. Um, so I'm going to speak from a teacher's perspective. And like sir said, I come from a technical background. So I definitely understand the importance of um, uh, technology in language learning as well as translation. Um, if I think when I finished my standard 10th and 12th, someone had asked me that if I would ever be a translator, uh, I don't think, uh, or a, a language teacher, I don't think that was a profession I envisaged or I planned or to, on becoming a teacher. But yes, here I am today. And I believe that uh, even though I changed career paths, um, it's, it's, uh, it's been extremely helpful, the technological background in uh, while teaching language, uh, language that's the French language, as well as while teaching translation, because that really helps me to understand why it is important. So um, just to mention, I teach at the Department of French and Francophone Studies at Goa University, and I teach students of both masters as well as bachelors. Uh, my main expertise lies in teaching the language as well as courses on translation. Uh, now that, uh, uh, brings me uh, to the point that I'm teaching at the university level for the last four years, and that's when I started teaching translation. Uh, also, in the last four years that I've seen a trend I have seen is that we have seen a rise in the number of students. Uh, of course, the student motivation varies from one to another. Some are there who are, while they are at the university, they really want to learn as many languages as they can, foreign languages I mean specifically, uh, because they are students of French. Uh, also, some are there who really want to improve their level of French and then some we see they, they just stagnate at a point. Uh, however, uh, most of them come in with, uh, uh, with the mindset that uh, I really want to be a French language teacher. For most of them, translation is a domain which is unknown or if they know about it, it's, uh, they are not so familiar with it. They, uh, they don't know really much about it. Uh, uh, however, uh, what I see while teaching translation, I will speak about translation at this point of time, uh, as I do see a lack of language skills and which also arises not because they do not know the language, the target or the source language, uh, but is, it is because I feel uh, due to a lack of reading, they are not aware of the domains. So one advice I always give my students uh, while teaching translation is that uh, please read as much as possible in the source as well as the target language, because that's what is going to help you to translate. Also, sometimes uh, they do come with a false sense of confidence, uh, thinking that, oh, I know a language, I can be a good translator. No, that's not going to happen. Um, in fact, that's something even arrived with me. Uh, I finished my master's. I thought, oh, great, I know French. Uh, 
and I know English. Uh, I'll be a great translator. But no, when I joined Bits Pune as a French English translator, I realized there's a lot more that I need to learn. Uh, so I did learn a lot on the job, thanks to the great mentors that I met, great colleagues that I met, and they really mentored me well, introduced me to the finer nuances of the profession. Um, also, another thing that I realized there to, uh, was uh, the use of uh, technology in translation, which I was not aware of. And to be precise, it is the use of CAT tools in translation. And which is something that's extremely important primordial today in uh, the translation industry. And I believe that if a translator doesn't know how to use a CAT tool, then it could be an impediment to one's career. So uh, when I uh, quit BITS and started teaching at Goa University, I started teaching translation as a paper. My main focus was to teach the paper, the subject, from an industry point of view, which I continue to do even today and in future as well. Uh, so the main thing that I do, I implement, is that I take texts from various domains. Uh, when we do the paper on general translation, when we do on scientific and technical, as well, we take from different domains as much as possible. Uh, we discuss the translations that the students have done. We see why a particular word or a term fits in the context or doesn't fit in the context, and what's the reason for that. And again, here's where I also encourage them once again to read. Um, another important thing I believe that I learned at the industry was um, uh, we do discuss document formatting, which is often overlooked and which is also an integral part of the industry. So I believe they must be great with their skills or at least good with their skills uh, while using Microsoft Office, especially Microsoft Word. Um, uh, then um, another aspect that I focus on is um, I conduct a session on using a CAT tool. Like I said, it's extremely important that they know how to use a CAT tool uh, because that's where now the CAT tools also come integrated with machine translators. And then if we use machine translation, we, use, uh, we, we translate the document 100% uh, using a machine translator, then how do we go on for correcting it or rather post editing it? So we also focus on that, focus on the importance of translation memory, uh, glossaries, why it's important, uh, and how it could help them further on in future. And um, a few things that I try to implement, uh, given the, the point that we are also discussing about employability, is uh, I focus on calling industry experts so that the students are aware of uh, uh, the current trends in the industry as to what are the skills they need to, uh, uh, to have, uh, what are the competencies they need to build, to, to have a job once they finish the course. Um, like, for example, today itself, we've started a session on subtitling uh, with an industry expert. So, which is, I believe, because which is also a really upcoming domain in a large way. And these are skills that the students must learn to be, uh, you know, to, to be able to find a job, to, to be employable. Um, uh, so, and as far as the language, uh, teaching goes, uh, if I mean, as uh, Sandeep sir also mentioned, the CLIL approach, uh, we do have papers also on uh, uh, French, uh, Francais Objective Specific, FOS, that is uh, French for specific purposes. Uh, I do teach one of them. And uh, we try to integrate uh, French or uh, in the, those specific uh, domains, how to use them, how to use the language in that domain. Also, uh, the use of technology that is uh, try to use different resources that are available on the internet to teach, uh, use videos, use audios, and uh, things like that to, to use to, to, to teach the language. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's far as uh, the technology is concerned and the way I teach. Uh, uh, but yeah, my main focus is uh, that the student should find a job, uh, should be employable. And uh, I myself, uh, I believe that it's important for us teachers also to keep upgrading our skills from time to time. So I see to it that I also attend workshops or teacher trainings or courses that help me to bring that knowledge back to my own classroom and to my students. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Shama. And uh, I think that brings us to the end of the panel discussion. And I think, uh, I will take over from here.
Hello everyone once again and uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all our wonderful panelists today and Sandeep for ma moderating this session. Thank you so much for your valuable insights and perspectives on the topic language learning in the era of translation technology. We definitely have a lot to take along from this discussion uh, and I hope you all enjoyed it a lot. Uh, please leave your comments in the chat box. You can also leave your comments in the comments section of our Facebook Live. <clears throat> and we wish to, we hope to see you also next year joining us the celebration of the European Day of Languages. But uh, before I end, um, I would like to invite you all to also join us on social media tomorrow. We have uh, the Romance film series. Uh, which is also quite interesting for you all and uh, please do join us there as well. Thank you so much for being here and have a good evening all of you. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.